Welcome back to another episode of Murderous Minors Killer Kids. This episode is brought to you by the State of Logic Podcast. Murderous Miners Killer Kids Season 2 Episode Number 14 Double the Overkill Part 1 The Samuel Twins Identical twins are often said to be wired the same, though they have different traits, personalities, and interests. Many sets of identical twins remain intensely connected long after they no longer share a living space. Feeling like they know each other's thoughts to literally completing each other's sentences, many remain connected. By all accounts, the Samuel twins were not reared in the most stable of households. 1964 Grand Rapids, Michigan found Michael and David Samuel born into a turbulent environment with numerous siblings ahead of them and parents who rarely and barely got along. Anthony and Grace Samuel's issues did not provide a traditional or even remotely healthy household, and the boys learned quickly to rely on one another for safety and comfort. Alcoholism and domestic abuse were reported in the home, and by the age of 10, the twins were considered pranksters and bullies by those who encountered them. When most youngsters would have been playing baseball or riding their bikes, the Samuel twins were shoplifting, breaking, and entering. By the mid-1970s, Michael Samuel was by far the more disturbed, violent brother and was usually the ringleader and instigator of their growing list of crimes and misdemeanors. He had already been identified for swiping bullets from a local shop. A 12-year-old girl went on to be shot in the neck with a BB gun, courtesy of Michael Samuel. The boys grew up tightly wound, becoming sullen teens looking for booze and money to feed their growing drug addictions. Although their personalities weren't the same, their identical appearances led to them being treated like they were one person. They were tall and lanky, with stringy dark hair long enough to hide their faces. Many in the area did not associate with them given their violent streaks and tendencies toward trouble. By the time they are 16, Michael and David have become hardcore partiers, often finding themselves out on the streets of Grand Rapids under the influence of drugs and alcohol, ready to find a thrill. They often gravitated towards the local billiards hall, the Golden 8 Ball, owned then by Ken Knoll. Michael's propensity toward violence, coupled with his love of throwing an ass-beating, culminate in his assault of a friend, whom he accused of stealing, resulting in a sentence of juvenile probation. The twins frequent the Golden 8-Ball religiously, becoming friends with employee Bobby Sellin, an 18-year-old who not only works there, but resides there as well. In October 1981, the twins are now 17, and Michael had started devising a plan to scrounge up some fast cash. David entered the room one night, catching the tail end of a conversation between his brother and their friend Patrick. The plan loosely outlined a robbery of their pool hall and their friend Bobby. Patrick points out that there is no chance that Bobby would allow himself or the pool hall to be robbed, alluding to the fact that it would be over Bobby's dead body. David protests, letting them know he doesn't want any part of robbing the Golden Eight. Michael assures them that he isn't really going to do it, but it seems evident that his intent has been fixed upon the idea of murder. The next visit to the billiards room began innocently at first. The boys showed up well after midnight and mingled with friends. They were drunk and stoned, but this was nothing unusual for them. Once Bobby had closed the establishment down for the night, the three friends head to his basement bedroom to play some after-hours poker. For the previous two years or so, Bobby had worked for Ken Knoll and was now the night manager, having the authority to lock down the money and close up shop. Ken Knoll allowed Bobby to stay down in the basement since he was mostly on his own at this point, but still quite young. 
It was in his basement apartment that the 18-year-old Robert Sellen was brutally attacked by the 17-year-old Samuel twins, whom he considered to be his friends. The murder was a brutal one, made even more tragic by the fact that the robbery netted the twins only $50. For $50, these teenage brothers not only strangled Bobby with a pair of nunchucks, they also struck him multiple times with a metal rod. They then alternated shooting him with a bow and arrow, finally ending his life with several catastrophic hammer blows to the skull. He was left unrecognizable. Robert Sellin's young life was cut short in a horrendous fashion for practically no other reason than to get some cash. The following morning, David Samuel went to their friend Patrick, upset and needing to talk. Around this time, Bobby's body had been found and the twins were immediately under suspicion. They were clearly the last two people known to have seen him alive. Michael is brought in for questioning first and was relaxed, cooperative, and calm. He says they left at 2 a.m. and that Bobby was most certainly alive when they left for the night. But once David spoke to investigators, it became clear that these two likely knew more than they were admitting. Once the twins' friends are questioned, it doesn't take long for investigators to catch up to one pal in particular. You know, Patrick, the one with the story about a conversation involving murder, plus the strange visit after Bobby had been killed. Within days following Bobby Sellin's murder, both Samuel twins are arrested. They are kept separate, but Michael was able to get a secret note out to David. However, it didn't make it to him successfully. The letter told David to let his lawyer know all the details. It seemed that Michael wanted to convince his twin that he didn't need to go down for crimes he didn't specifically commit. It was never clarified as to which twin perpetrated what crime against the defenseless, outnumbered Bobby Sellin, but the secret letter made it clear that Michael felt more responsible for what happened. Michael felt strongly enough that he held more fault for the crime that he risked disciplinary action to urge his twin to put the blame where it rightly lay. Michael felt strongly enough that he held more fault for the crime that he risked disciplinary action to urge his twin to put the blame where it rightly lay although it may have bode worse for Michael himself. In 1982, at 18 years old, Michael Samuel plea bargained to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 35 to 55 years in prison. He was paroled in 2009, getting out early for good behavior, and was last known to be a transient around the Grand Rapids area. David Samuel, however, opted for a trial, wanting to plead his case in front of a jury. However, he was given a non-jury trial. Once Kent County Circuit Court Judge Stuart Hoffius was done hearing testimony, he immediately sentenced David to life without parole. Two widely differing sentences considering both teens admitted to participating in Bobby's murder. When you consider that the sentence should reflect the extent to which each individually took part, it is even more perplexing an outcome. Michael admittedly played a heavier role and was seen as the more violent of the pair. Choosing to plead the case that he was less innocent than his twin backfired tremendously, as there was no jury to persuade and the judge simply would not be swayed. As has been covered here in past episodes, the United States Supreme Court ruled juvenile life without parole sentences unconstitutional in 2012, triggering retroactive resentencings around the country. David Samuel was still incarcerated and this ruling applied to him. In 2015, he was the first of nine inmates in Michigan to be resentenced. In 2015, he was the first of nine inmates in Michigan to be resentenced. Now, instead of mandatory life imprisonment, teen killers face a minimum 25 to 40 years with a maximum term of 60 years. Would it surprise you to know that there is one member of Bobby Sellin's family who befriended the twins and even supported their release? Well, at the time of his murder, Bobby Sellin had twin half-sisters who were 15 years old. When David Samuel was being held in the county jail following his arrest, 15-year-old Tammy Smith, a twin herself, hurled threats and verbal abuse at one of the twins who took her brother's life. 
She wanted him to know that her family was now in pieces. The Smith twins then tried to live their lives for the next 20 years. In 2001, they realized that Michael Samuel was going to get out, and the prospect of his release within the decade sparked questions within Bobby's younger sisters. They wondered what the Samuel twins were like then, as middle-aged men having reached maturity while incarcerated. Tammy took a leap and wrote Michael a letter. Quickly, they became pen pals, and she slowly began to see him as more than just a killer. David wrote, too, and over time, the three began to speak on a regular basis. She started to feel like further incarceration served no purpose here and took it upon herself to make her opinion clear to those who may care what she thought. She was at Michael Samuel's parole board hearing and spoke in favor of David's release at his resentencing hearing. I want him to do what is right and for the rest of his life really look back on this and and appreciate all the support that he's had and to not make this mistake twice. The judge acknowledged that her statement had a positive effect on his decision. I think perhaps Mr. Samuel has been confined long enough, given the totality of circumstances. The judge sentenced Samuel to 34 and a half years, making him immediately eligible for parole. Those familiar with the case say there is no reason that he should not see release as soon as the board meets again. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, the State of Logic podcast, to hear real talk about real topics. The State of Logic podcast is like no other. We don't have the same focus as so many other podcasts where we're just me talking about business or politics or whatever. We talk about everything with everyone, intellectuals, comedians, and celebrities alike. Sometimes it's a 20-minute interview. Sometimes it's a three-hour interview. But at the end of the day, it's a great conversation that we often laugh about and learn something from at the same time. Come check us out at the State of Logic podcast. Murderous Miners Killer Kids Season 2 Episode 14 Double the Overkill Part 2 The Whitehead Twins One baby is most certainly a blessing, but I consider identical twins a mini-miracle of biology. Twins Tasmaya and Jasmaya Whitehead were adored by their mother Nikki, who just wanted them to grow up living a different kind of childhood than hers. Jarmeka Nikki Whitehead was born while her mother was incarcerated on drug possession charges. Linda Whitehead had previously been in trouble with the law for robbery and prostitution. According to a friend, her mother Linda didn't want to raise her or take any responsibility for Nikki's upbringing. Nikki was reared almost exclusively by Grandma Della Frazier, who described Nikki as a bit of a rolling stone. Teenage Nikki ran free and even lived on the streets for a bit as a teen. She then had her own apartment at a young age, rather than be subject to rules and expectations. When she was 18, she became pregnant with identical twin daughters, born November 27, 1993. Her daughters were fathered by a married man who already had an established family, He did not want to be a part of their lives and was a felon who was deported to Canada by the time the girls were in their teens. Nikki and the twins lived with Della and her husband since the twins were born. Nikki was not, however, the twins' primary caregiver, and they considered Della their mother. Although Della Frazier worked full-time at Coca-Cola and then the newspaper, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, she maintained that she enjoyed raising the twins. Della recalled that they were smart, polite, and respectful as children and excelled in whatever they did. Della made sure that her great-granddaughters had piano and ballet lessons and learned how to play tennis. They performed well at school and were considered gifted. As a young mother, Nikki was not prepared to care for two young children and Della felt that she was not only raising the twins but still raising their mother too. At 25, Nikki met a man and then began dating on and off, developing a close relationship. 
30 years her senior, Robert Head was smitten and soon moved Nikki into his cozy home in the gated Blue Ridge.